Overflow. And we're going to pick up uh, part three now. Uh, last week we started part one at, at our evening service, did part two. If you missed the evening service, I don't know what to tell you. You really missed an amazing time. But you, you need to get the podcast. You need to listen to that message and, uh, and catch up on this and be in the flow. I'm not going to re-preach it. Uh, this morning, but uh, a couple weeks or last week, we started talking about this idea of how we handle finances and what the Bible says about finances and how we can experience a financial overflow in our lives. How many of you would like a financial overflow? Come on, that, that would be nice. You, you open up your bank account and there's just a little bit extra than what you thought inside of there. I don't know if you've ever experienced an overflow like that. Maybe today in communion, your cup was overflowing and spilling. Uh, I, it, how, I think financial overflow is something everyone desires. Financial overflow is something everyone kind of longs for, uh, but many times we aren't sure quite how to get it. But the Bible talks a lot about how we use our finances. It talks a lot about uh, God's design uh, for our lives and for even a financial blessing. And so we began talking about this last week, and I want to continue today uh, in part three. And uh, I want you to write, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down on the top. Write this down. First things first. First things first. This is what the, the Bible says. Let me give you a couple of scriptures, and then uh, I want to jump in. In fact, you know, let, let me review with you a little bit of the last couple of weeks, and then I'll give you the scriptures. Last week, uh, we talked about this idea uh, that what... For us to step into blessing, especially financial blessing, means we need to live according to God's principles of financial blessing, right? When you uh, live according to that principle, that's how you access the blessing. I don't know if you've ever been to McDonald's. Actually, I do know this is Singapore. Everyone's been to McDonald's. Uh, we, it's a national treasure of ours. Have you ever gone to McDonald's and lined up for a really long time only to find out you're not in the cash register line, you're in the pickup line? Do you know what I'm talking about? And you can line there all day long, but if you don't line up according to the principle that McDonald's operates in, how I many know your double cheeseburger is never going to come? That McSpicy is just a pipe dream. There's a principle, and you get all the way to the front, and you're smiling at them, and they're looking at you, and you're just smiling, and they say, uh, sir, back of the line over there, you know, and, and you just walk back to the back. There's a principle that I have to operate by if I want to access that blessing. Well, in the same way, God is a God that operates by principle. Uh, God is not fickle. The Bible says God doesn't change. In fact, he's the same yesterday, today, and come on, and forever. So he never changed. How is it possible for God never to change? No matter whether the weather is hot or cold, no matter whether it seems like things are going well or not, no matter the circumstance, God never changes. And the, the way that that happens is because God always operates according to his principle. What he's spoken in his word never changes. And so when I understand the principle, that's when I come into agreement with God's heart, his way, and I actually begin to access his blessing and his overflow in my life. What I understand foundationally is this. First of all, if I want to really manage finance well and access that financial overflow that God's intended for me, I need to understand primarily that everything belongs to God. My Bible starts this way, and yours does too, I hope. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created everything we see. Not only did he create everything we see and have and own, he, he, he gives life to each and every one of us. He calls our name and knows us before we were even born, the scripture says. Uh, it, the Bible goes on to say it is God who gives you the power to get well. Who is it that gives you strength and breath and life and creativity and wisdom? It is God that enables us to do those things. He created everything. He gives us everything. And so this principle is paramount to everything else. When I understand everything I have comes from God, it changes the way I treat my finance and my possessions. Because all of a sudden I realize that we are stewards. Or a steward is like a biblical word for like a manager. I'm a manager of what God has entrusted me with in my life. Of my time, my talent, my relationships, right? My, my family. Come on, if you're a parent, you're a steward of that child growing up in your house. I'm a steward of those 
finances that come in, right? And how I handle my finance is actually a reflection of my stewardship in general in life. Jesus said it this way, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. He talked a lot about and used uh, finances a lot as an illustration, not because money is the only thing we talk about in church. It's not. It's not the most important thing, but because in this world, money tends to have a big hold on our heart. And he says, you know what? Everything belongs to God. We're to be stewards of that. And all of a sudden, that changes the way I look at my finance. Now I'm more interested in God. What would you have me do? Lord, how would you have me use this? God, how could I manage this to bring you the most glory? Lord, is this the right move? Is it the right investment? Is this the right purchase? God, everything belongs to you. And as a steward, that means that I need to obey. That means I need to trust, right? And the reason we struggle a lot of time with this idea of stewardship, we talked about it on Sunday night, is because of this root issue in our lives, and the Bible calls it covetousness. Covetousness. This is not a a very popular topic in our society and in our culture, and yet it is at the root of our financial issues. Covetousness is an inordinate desire to have more. I'm full, but I just want one more bite. Have you ever had the buffet dilemma? I ate too much, I can't move, but I still gonna get one more plate. It's an inordinate desire for more. But financially, in your life, in every way, this can take a hold of our heart. I, I want more. I desire more. I need more. I don't even know why. There's no reason for it. And everything becomes about me, my desire, my want. We get wrapped up in this. And, and, and what happens is it starts to affect the way I can use my finance and possessions. It starts to affect my stewardship because the root of covetousness changes my perspective. And suddenly I, I'm convinced maybe God isn't really giving me the best. Maybe I need to give myself the best. Are you with me? Maybe God, maybe God, it, his way isn't really right. I, I need this and I'm not going to have enough. So I just want to take back and do it my way. And this is what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve. They had all the trees. God said, don't touch one tree. And Eve was finally convinced, I need this thing to make me happy, covetousness. That this the idea that this thing is going to bring me contentment, this holiday, this lifestyle, this relationship, this mindset, these possessions, you can be covetous for something and be so convinced that that thing is going to con bring contentment to your heart. But the Bible says we're to delight ourselves in the Lord. That God is the one that brings satisfaction. Jesus said, I came that you would have life and life more abundantly. Come on. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life. And, and so I find real life, real fulfillment, real contentment in Christ. Not, not in my ability to do something on my own. Now, I want to move on this morning, and I want to teach some really important principles today. I believe you're going to be blessed by this. And I, I want you to catch it. Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10. This is the verse that we've been centering around the last couple weeks here. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits. Everyone say first fruits. First fruits. Come on, shout it out. Say first fruits. First fruits. Some of you are getting a little quiet. You're worried I'm going to try to take your money at the end of this. I'm not, I don't want your money. God doesn't want your money. He's after your heart. Now listen, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Now, of course, we don't have a lot of barns in Singapore. This is an agricultural society. A barn would be like your bank account. He's talking about your storehouse, where you put resources, where, where your value is, your investments, the possessions of your life. He goes, there will be an overflow. There's going to be a, a blessing that would come on you. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, your vats bursting with new wine. God desires to bring an overflow into your life. God desires that we would live in blessing. Malachi 3 verse 10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple or in my house. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies. I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. 
Try it. Put me to the test. He says, how many of you like this? I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have room enough to take it in. You, the bank will call you, say, maxed out. You can't put any more money in this bank account. There's too much money. Wow. Come on. You got to buy a second wallet. You know what I'm talking about? Now, he's not only talking about money, but there's, a, there's an application here to finance. I, I want you to catch God's heart, though, because a lot of people think God doesn't want you to be blessed. He doesn't, well, he's not interested in your finance. No, God is interested in your life, the sum of your life, right? And he's teaching a principle here. How do you access that kind of overflow? Luke 16, 11 and 12, Jesus said, if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with the things of your own? I want you to catch this morning, this idea. First things first. How do we step into financial overflow? Well, God owns everything. I deal with this idea of covetousness. I settle this in my heart. But now I need to move on to apply these principles in my life and in my situation. And the first thing I want you to get from all of this is that God actually desires to bless. Not only does he desire to bless, but he's given promises of his blessing. Proverbs 3.10 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, the first fruits of your produce, and then your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats will be bursting with new wine. There will be a blessing that comes upon you. And from the start of creation, this is what God does. He created man, and the Bible says he blessed them. The first time God interacts with human beings, we see him blessing them. Don't you know God's desire has always been to bless us? God is not angry at you. God is not against you. God desires to bless you. When we put our faith in Jesus, the Bible says, we receive a blessing through Christ Jesus. We have the blessing of salvation and relationship with him. God could have left us alone, but because he desires to see us blessed, he draws us near to himself. And we are truly blessed when we operate in his way, right? This is, this is the, the case in my spiritual life. The Bible says if I believe in Jesus, then my, I am saved. If I confess my sins, I am forgiven. I have to operate his way. Come on. The Bible says I, I honor my father and mother and it will go well with me. There will be a blessing on my life. There are principles. And the same is true financially when I operate his way. God desires to bless me. When I'm convinced of this, I recognize this key thing, that God is actually my source. I don't know if you realize this, but your boss, your paycheck, your company is not your true source. Some of you, if you've been around for a while, you know paychecks come and go. Sometimes jobs come and go. But there is a source that is beyond those things. His name is Jesus. Yes. Come on, there is a source that is greater than whatever right now is bringing financial provision in my life. It's just a tool that God uses to supply the needs that I have. God promised that he would supply all of my needs. God promised that. I guarantee you, your boss never promised you that. But God promised that. I mean, I've had, I've had financial provision come into my life from all kinds of avenues. I've had times when, when, when I, I didn't have a job and, and people were giving me money, strangers walking up, passing me things, unexpected provision, unexpected blessing, unexpected open doors. I've seen God do so many things in my life. I know that God is my source. I remember praying about this in, in university and had a bunch of school loans, and I watched some of my friends not having so many scholarships and grants, or they had money from their family, and I began to pray and say, God, I don't see why all of these guys can go to school so cheap or free, and here I am, you know, my parents are pastors, we don't have a lot of finance, I don't want to start ministry with a bunch of loans and a bunch of financial debt, Lord, you can supply my need. Well, by the next year, God had so provided for, for my schooling and my financial situation, different grants, scholarships came in, all of this stuff. When I showed up at the office to pay my bill, they wrote me a check and gave me money and said, you've got too much financial provision. We're going to give you some back. I got paid to go to school. Hallelujah. Shouldn't it always be the way? But how does that happen? Come on. God is my soul. God is the one. 
God is the one that brings that into my life. He can give supernatural favor and provision. If you think your job is your source, you'll become a slave to your job. If you think you are your source, you will become a slave to your own desires. And, you know, I've got to do this. I have to earn that. I have to get this or I won't have that. And you get wrapped up in a world and you forgot that there is a God in heaven that desires to bless you. And he is the source of everything. He's the source of everything. I count people with this all the time. They take some job that they can't come to church anymore. They got to work Sundays. And I tell them, tell them you won't work Sundays. Well, but they don't allow that. That's fine. Take a stand. You don't need that job more than you need God. You need God more than you need the job. He's the source. He's, he's the, the one that gives favor, provision. He owns everything. And if he's the source, then I, I need to be interested in how do I access his provision? I access it by faith and obedience. Now, if God is my source, check this out, because we're going somewhere this morning. If God is my source, then the issue in my finances is not how do I get more money? It's how do I honor God more? Because God, my Bible says, owns everything. He, 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 said he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But if you translate it to today's context, he owns the Mercedes in a thousand Mercedes dealerships. Come on, amen. Some of you don't want a cattle. You don't want a cow or a goat. Say, I, I don't need that. But he owns everything. If he owns everything, then there's no issue for God to bless, provide, right, enable so the question is, how do I honor God? Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 gives us a key here for our financial blessing and, and overflow. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all of your produce. Honor God. It doesn't, it, interesting. He doesn't say invest wisely. He doesn't say, hey, talk to a financial planner. No, that's fine. He doesn't say, make sure you get a good interest rate. He says, honor the Lord. Honor the Lord. Recognize the source from your life. This word honor is specific. It means to give weight to or distinguish. So in other words, I give weight to this idea that God is actually above everything. I give weight to it in the attention that I give to God. I give weight to it in how I'm generous toward the Lord. I give weight to it in how I operate according to God's principles and not the principles of this world. I actually show with my life, God, I believe you're the source. I believe you want to bring overflow. And so the way I live reflects this. Honoring God in my finance means recognizing that it comes from him and choosing to operate according to his principles. Because the right response is always going to yield the right results. Amen. The right response from my life. And, and so when I get this in my heart, God actually desires to bless me. He's the source of everything. And, and now it's about honoring God. Then I, I understand this truth that God has to come first. If he's the source, if he's the one that gives everything, if actually blessing comes from God, if the overflow comes from him, if he's the one that can uh, release that over my life and provide for every need, he said, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you're going to eat and where, what you're going to wear and all these things. I will supply all of your needs. And I can tell you, I've grown up in a, in a household that lived by faith my entire life. We've chosen to live our life by faith and trust God through so many situations. I've never seen my family forsaken. I've never seen a time where there wasn't a need met by God. But I, but I have to come to this point that I realize, God, if you're the source, if I'm going to honor God, that means God must come first. That's honoring, right? God must come first. We, we try to honor people, you know, in our society now. You see maybe an elderly person. You try to let them go in front of you on the MRT. Hey, you're supposed to let them take that seat. You're not supposed to pretend you're asleep. <laughs> Guilty laughter. All right. So I, why? I honor, right? I, I put someone else first in front of me. God is first. He's before everything. And when you study the scripture and you begin to look at, at what the Bible says about finances, uh, provision, wealth, you're going to find this one principle that first things belong to the Lord. The first things belong to God. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with your first fruits. Everyone say first fruits. First fruits. 
One more time. Come on, say first fruits. first fruits. Now, we don't grow plants and trees very much unless you have one of those neighbors that has a little forest outside their HDB flat. But generally, we don't do that, but we understand the principle, the first thing. He says, honor the Lord with your wealth and something specific, the first fruits. Why? Because in the Bible, first things belong to God. Deuteronomy 26, verse 1 to 4 says this. When you enter the land the Lord God is giving you as a special possession, and you've conquered it and settled it. This is, this is to the children of Israel. Put some of the first. Everyone shout first. First. The first produce from each crop you harvest into a basket and bring it to the designated place of worship. Now, this is interesting. He, there's a couple principles wrapped up in here. He's talking about tithes, but he's dealing specifically with this idea of the first things. And then the, you're going to bring it to the place designated for worship, the place your Lord God, the Lord God chooses for his name to be honored. Go to the priest and in charge at that time and say to him, with this gift, I acknowledge to the Lord your God that I have entered the land he swore to our ancestors he would give us. And the priest will take the basket and set it before the altar of the Lord your God. He goes, when I give the first thing to God, I recognize that it was God that gave it to me. Are you with me? When I honor God first, I recognize, Lord, it all came from you, and I can honor you first because you have the ability to give more. And when all through Scripture you find this, the first of their flock, the first lamb, the first goat, the first of their produce, they would bring it to the Lord. And, and what the principle here is that when I treat the first part correctly, the rest that I have is blessed. The rest becomes blessed when I treat the first correctly. Now, this goes beyond finances. This is a life principle. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You know, right now, we're meeting here uh, today, worshiping God on a Sunday. Did you know that Sunday is not the end of the week? It's the beginning of the week. Some of you need to change your calendar on your iPhone and fix this problem in your mind. Some of you thinking, oh, if I could just make it to the weekend. No, the weekend was yesterday. This is the beginning of the week. And the reason the early church does this, it, it, it's Resurrection Sunday, and it was the first day of the week. And we give the first of our week to the Lord, believing God, as we honor you with the first, the rest is blessed. Come on. With my finance, the same thing. When I put him first, I trust him with the rest. Think about Abraham when God challenges him and says, I want you to offer Isaac on the altar, your firstborn son, the son of promise, right? Through Sarah. And the promise to Abraham is, I'm going to give you so many children. You're going to be a great nation. I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to use you. And then God says, sacrifice your first son. Now imagine what's going through Abraham's mind. He doesn't know, are there going to be any other son? I'm not sure about it, but he says, give it to me first. Sacrifice first. Begin to offer that first. Even in the Old Testament, this is very different than us. We get a paycheck every month. When I honor God first, I give him my tithes. That's not quite the same as what it felt like as someone in that nation. When you have a, a, a sheep and they give birth to a lamb and you give the first lamb to God, you're not sure, is this sheep ever going to have another lamb? There's a risk involved. There's like a faith involved in that. And we take it for granted because we know X amount's coming next month, the month that, well, I guess you don't really know. I mean, you could lose your job or something, but it, it's a little bit different for us. But this principle has to be the same. Lord, the first thing comes from you. The first thing. The first check I write. The first thing I do, I give to the Lord. The first things I set it aside. The first thing when God blesses, I honor him back. And I say, God, because I, it's not legalistic. I'm not under some kind of weird bondage in it. It's I recognize, Lord, you are my source. All of this came from you, and you can do it again. You can multiply. You can make it overflow. Everything comes from you. When I honor God with my first fruits, I step into overflow. How many teachers, you give to the Lord, you, you, you give your tithes to God, you begin to pay your tithes, you, you give, you know, faith pledge or whatever. You, don't, don't give God the leftover. Don't wait till after all your bills and then you see like, okay, well, I guess I can tithe this and I can give that. Give God the first fruit. The first fruit. Because when I give him the first fruit, the rest becomes blessed. It's a perspective. Genesis 4, 
tells the story of Cain and Abel, and it says, when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. And Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. Say first fruit. And the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain angry, and he looked dejected. Wow. So what's the issue here? Well, Cain brought some. It says, over the course of time, eventually Cain brought some things to God, but Abel goes, no, I'm honoring God first. You get the firstborn. You get the beginning. You get it right at the front. I don't know if, it, if the rest is enough to sustain me, but God, you are the source. Lord, this animal, this tree, this plant, this job, this is not my source, so you are honored first. And when I honor God first, everything else becomes blessed. Are you with me this morning? And this is why, let me, let me shift a little bit. This is why as we learn about tithing, it becomes so powerful because these two principles work together. This idea of the first fruit and the tithe, right? The tithe is 10%, but it's not just any kind of 10%. It's that first fruit, the first 10%, the first thing I do, there's a positioning of my heart that I put God before anything else. And it becomes a key to financial overflow. We read this in the beginning. Malachi 3.10, bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, I will open the windows of heaven and I'll pour out a blessing so great you won't have room to take it in. So all of a sudden we realize that one of God's key in, in finances in my life, when I catch this, Lord, you're the source. And so I want to honor you as the source. When I honor God as the source, it means I put him first in everything that I do, first in all my uh, in, in all of my dealings. And as I'm doing that, how do I do that? How do I implement that through this principle of the tithe? And the tithe is, is something taught all the way through Scripture, something that existed from ancient times. You find it legislated by the law and affirmed by the New Testament. But the tithe is this. Let me teach you for a minute. Some of you look a little bit uh, upset this morning, a little bit bored. You want to tell us some stories. We want some jokes. You know, like, I don't want to talk about money. I, I'm sorry. I, I came to just to pastor you. I didn't come to entertain you. Is that all right? I'm not a clown. I'm a pastor. All right? I got I to gotta teach you what's going to help you grow in your life so there would be an overflow. All right? You can go to Kitty Palace or something if you want to be entertained. But this is more important for you. So what is the tithe? The tithe is 10. It literally means 10. The word tithe means 10. It's a 10% of everything I earn and everything I receive. That is the tithe, right? It's the first fruit. And the tithe is the part that God says, this is mine. Return it to me. You, God gives everything and he says, I want you to return 10% to me. Now, it's not God taking from you because God gives everything. This is what you have to understand. God's not he's trying to steal your money. God gives you everything. He says, you can have it all, but the 10%, I want you to bring back to me. Now, what does that mean? Let me teach you a little bit, and then, then we'll get into this, and, and, and I, I believe God's going to speak to your heart. What, what is, well, let me talk about what tithing is not. Tithing is not, first of all, a donation. It's not a donation. This is not flag day. This is not like, well, uh, let me just help out the church. They're kind of struggling. I noticed like, you know, Pastor Sala needs a new t-shirt or something. So I like to put a little more in the offering this week. Uh, that, it's not a donation, okay? Tithing is not like you feel bad. Oh man, you know, let me help those poor guys. And, and you put it in. That's not the tithe. Tithe is not also giving. This is important. Tithe is not me giving anything to God. This is returning to God what belongs to him. Are you hearing me? Yeah. So if I, you, you do this all the time at home. Some of you get upset when you think about tithing, but think about the principle. Your kid comes to you if you're a parent. If you're a kid, you go to your parent, say like, hey, I want to eat some lunch. Can I have money? You give them a $10 bill, right? And after a while, a couple of days go by, and you start thinking like, hey, how much was that lunch? Where's the change, you know? Where, where is the rest? In fact, you can have this part for your lunch, but that other part belongs to me. Can you give it back, please? Hello? Come on, help. All the youth are really quiet. It, <laughs> it, so, and, and when you give it back, right? When my, my kids come to me and say, Dad, here's the change. They don't come to me and say, Oh, Father, blessed and gracious Father, I have come with an offering of first fruits to bring to you. 
I recognize you as my source and my supply. No, I just say, give me back my money. They just, they return it. It was mine. It was always mine. They don't get a special award for giving it back. That belongs to me. All right, now we're tracking. In the same way in the tithe, God gives you everything. He'll say, give back the 10%, and you give back the 10% to God. You are returning to God what is his. You're returning. Not giving. It's not because I'm so generous. Not I'm not grateful. I return. Now, God will bless you if you do it. There's a blessing for obedience. There's a blessing for faithfulness. This is the key, the number one key to financial overflow in your life. But it's not giving, it's returning. And i got to get that, Lord. Everything comes from you, and I want to honor you and be faithful. And so the first fruit, I give it to you. It belongs to you. It's, it, what, is, what is tithing not? Tithing is not negotiable. It's not negotiable. This is not a sliding scale. Well, I feel like, you know, I'm a little tight this month, maybe 5%. I'll do 7.5 next month. I, I feel a little more generous, 12.5. It, it's not negotiable. It's a set thing. It's a percentage. It's 10%. Tithing is not for me to use. He says, bring the tithe into the storehouse. In other words, I don't choose where my tithe goes. I see an animal shelter. I say, this month I'm giving my tithe to help puppies. You know, next month I saw someone on, on the internet about some kind of relief effort down in Haiti. I'm going to give some, build some huts down there. No, no, the tithe belongs to God. And we return the tithe to the house of the Lord, right? We bring it in his house that there could be food in his house, he says. In other words, that it would, it actually is God's mechanism to support his kingdom work here on earth. In that day, the temple, today, the church. I don't decide. And what is tithing not? It is not the leftovers. It's not at the end of all my bills and all my stuff and all my commitments. Then whatever I've left, I just kind of throw something into God. No, it is the first thing. Now, a lot of people struggle with tithing. A lot of people will argue about this. Say, well, you know, I don't believe that we're supposed to tithe. I don't think the Bible teaches it. No, you haven't read your Bible for me. People say, try to tell you, like, well, no, I don't think in the New Testament we need to die. No, you need to read your Bible again because the Bible says Abraham tithed in Genesis 14, 20 before the law ever came out. Jacob tithed in Genesis 28, 22. Where do you think Jacob learned to tithe unless his father and grandfather, he had seen them tithing? Jacob didn't just come up with this idea on his own. Moses wasn't around. The five books of the Old Testament weren't around. So he, he understood the principle of tithing. Then the tithe was legislated by the Mosaic Law in Leviticus 27 and verse 30 and 33. You see it now administrated clearly. How do you do it? Where do you do it? When do you do it? In fact, it was so important that if, if you read in the Bible, whenever there were major revivals in Israel, one of the things, the key components of what was revived was worship and also the bringing of the tithe. Nehemiah uh, chapter 10, verse 36 to 39, there were many other instances when there was a spiritual revival, suddenly the people knew we need to bring back our tithe to the Lord. We need to honor God. And this began to be re-implemented in their hearts and lives. Then you find in the New Testament, tithing affirmed again. Jesus affirmed the tithe in Matthew 23, 23. He says, oh, the Pharisees, you tithe on this, you tithe on that, but you neglect people. He says, you should have done the tithing and not neglected people. He affirmed the tithe. He had every, every right and ability to say, actually, you didn't need to tithe, but he never said that. He actually affirmed it and, and actually uh, comes in support of tithing. Hebrews 7, 6, then the book of Hebrews starts to talk about how Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, again, the New Testament. And Hebrews is getting all the way through telling us how we don't need sacrifices anymore. We just need Jesus. But he never says we don't need tithe. No, he says, no, actually, Abraham tithe. And spiritually, that means Levi tithe to Melchizedek. They, they pay tithes. It even says Jesus receives tithes in heaven. You read your Bible. And, and, and they affirm, the New Testament affirms this practice. Some people will say, well, I'm not under the, the law. I'm under grace. That's excellent because grace does so much more than the law. So you're free to gracefully give 20% tithes, 30%, 40%. Praise God that you are under grace. It is never less than the law. It is always more than the law. Read your Bible. Come on. Some people don't like to tithe because they just don't like people telling them what to do with their money. Pastor, I don't like you talking about finances and these things. Look, I, I'm telling you what the Bible says and what I want you to understand is this. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your money. He's after your heart. But let me ask you this. If money has your heart, why would God give you more money? If, if, 
wealth and earthly things have in my heart, why would I expect God to bless me with more of it? So let me talk to you quickly about the tithe, this 10% that is for everyone. How do we view this? 10% of everything I earn, everything I receive, my salary, allowance, my profit, I, I bring 10%, the first group, the first thing I bring back to God and I honor Him. And this is what brings the overflow in my life. Three things that I want you to understand about the tithe this morning, and then we're done. The first thing is this. The tithe is holy. Everyone say, it's holy. Holy. It's holy. Malachi 3, verse 8 to 10 says, Will a mere mortal, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you, God? And he answers this way in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. In other words, they weren't bringing the tithe in. And he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there will be food in my house. The concept that God is getting to is this. The tithe is holy. It belongs to him. I don't have time. It would take many sermons to explain this. But the idea of things that are holy to God is that holy things are only for God's use. They are for special use. Your toothbrush is holy. It is only for use in your mouth. You don't use it, I hope, to clean the sink. I hope you don't use it to clean the toilet. Your toothbrush doesn't belong in anyone else's mouth. Come on, amen. And it's, it's holy to you. Well, spiritually, he says there's certain things that are only for use in the temple. Certain things are only given to me. They are dedicated to God, and from that point, they belong to God. And God designates the tithe, that tent. Portion, the first three says, that's mine, and because it's mine, it belongs to me. Don't touch it. Don't do other things with it. This belongs to God. It does not belong to me. And once that happens, it, the tithe becomes a test of my faithfulness and my obedience. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden. You can have every tree in the garden, but that one tree don't touch, touch. It's a test of their faithfulness and their obedience. Will you honor what belongs to God and enjoy what belongs to you? Or will you take what belongs to God? It's a test. Now, we don't like that idea. Well, what, why is God testing? That doesn't sound very nice. Look, you do this all the time. All the time. I can't tell you how many times after church I'm with somebody and there's a little kid, two, three years old, and one of you in every location, I want you to catch it, you are the one, you walk up to them and you give them biscuits, you give them crackers, you give them sweets, all kinds of bad things our kids eat at church because of nice people. <laughs> And after you give it to them, how many of you have given something to your niece, your nephew, your grandchild, your kid? You give them a few sweets and then you say, can I have it back? Can I have one? Come on. And what do you do? You're testing that kid. Do you love me or do you love the sweet? And the kid's like, I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure, you know, and finally, if they give you one sweet, they go, oh, no, it's okay, you can have it, no, 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 it's okay, come on, we, why, we, we test their heart, we don't care about the sweet, I hope not, we don't care about that cracker, that piece of seaweed, we, we test their heart, and God says, hey, I want to see your heart, I can give you more stuff, I cure finances, but would you be faithful, would you return this to me, as you're faithful, I can bless you. It's holy. It's a constant reminder to me, my flesh, and the world that God is in charge and that God is my source. The tithe is holy to God. And that means no matter how much I make or earn, the tithe belongs to the Lord. When my salary comes in, the tithe belongs to God. Hey, before your CPF, tithe the whole thing. 10%, God, you gave it all to me. I'm giving it to you, this 10% back. When your allowance comes, you might not have a salary. You're a young person. Your allowance, but I, I make so little. That's right. But if you want to make more, tithe to God. Come on. When I earn or I receive, I, I have an investment comes due. I sell a house. There's profit. God, in other words, God, you did this. You brought this into my life. I want to honor you and recognize you're the source. Not my intelligence, not my investments, not my scheme, not the economy. Lord, you are my source. It's 10% of my increase, and it's holy unto the Lord. It belongs to you, God. Tithe is holy. Secondly, as the worship comes, the tithe is first. It is first. Everyone say it's first. 
It's the first fruits. We talked about this already. I don't wait and see how much is left over. I, 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 I do it first because honoring him with the first means I'm trusting him with the rest. I'm trusting him with the rest. I do it the first. I, I want to make sure that's set aside first, brought in the house of God first. And then, Lord, I'm trusting you with that 90%. You're going to get me to the end of this month. You're going to get me to the end of all of my needs. Father, I want to trust you first. And this is the part we really struggle with, with finances. This is the part that's hard, to make God the first in everything. Because we like to put ourselves first. Hey, Jen comes in, oh man, I'm going to eat this, I'm going to go there, I'm going to buy this. Man, this is awesome. I mean, you can tell when some people just got paid, right? You can tell. They went from like chicken rice to like a buffet at the Shangri-La. It's like, it, last three weeks, only chicken rice. Today, they, they want to eat out, they want to spend money, they're wearing a new jacket. I mean, because and there's nothing wrong with any of that, but this is why we struggle, because we like to put ourselves first. And it's funny because we can struggle to say, God, the 10% belongs to you. But don't you know you would spend that same amount of money on a bunch of stuff that we don't need? We have no problem wasting our money. That same, that same amount on cabs I didn't need to take, on desserts that I regret eating later. I go, why did I eat that? You know, but when God says, hey, that's mine, I don't, I don't know about that. I, I, I'm not sure. Can I trust God first? I honor you first. I, I, I want to recognize that you're my source first, Lord. I return to you what belongs to you. And third, the tithe is an act of faith. It's an act of faith. It's an act of faith because I don't know what's coming. It's an act of faith because I'm taking God at his word. It's an act of faith because I'm obeying him and saying, Lord, you said if I honor you with my first fruits, first fruits the rest, God, would come under your blessing. There would be an overflow. Lord, you said, if I would honor you, you would supply all of my needs. You would give me more than enough. And I'm allowing you, God, to bless my finances. I'm not going to try to bless myself. I'm allowing you. I, it's an act of faith because I recognize that his supply never fails. And God says, test me in this. Try me. Just try it. Just honor me. Just put me first in everything and watch. If I don't open the windows of heaven and pour out blessing upon your life that you cannot contain, God is a blessing. And the overflow starts when I put first things first. Are you with me this morning? Tonight, I want to move on and begin to talk about generosity and, and, and us beginning to flow, not just paying God our tithes, but stepping into a realm of generosity and God's generous supply. But this morning, you know, I, I want to say this. God is after our hearts. And I want us to take a moment. We're going to worship. And in this moment before we end, if you find that maybe, maybe things have had a hold on your heart. Maybe you haven't been faithful at honoring God in the time. That first verse, you haven't left it to the Lord. You've taken it sometimes for yourself to other things. Would you take a moment this morning and say, God, you know what? I want to come back in alignment with your word. I want to make a commitment today, God, that I'm going to honor you first. I'm going to put you above. I'm going to give weight to your word, to your principles, and to your command. I'm going to step out in faith and treat as holy what belongs to you. Can we stand this morning as we begin to worship right now? Thank you, Jesus.